All right, I want to welcome everybody at 10.01. Good to see you all for Psalm 50, one third of the Psalms. Again, I look at each of you with gratitude that you have uh, been here learning together. It has been an opportunity for me to delve deeply into Psalms. Today, Psalm 50 is also called the Robinson Crusoe Psalm. You may recall the book or the movie. I remember the movie vividly as a child. The, the book by Daniel Defoe actually came out in 1719 and was the story of a castaway who would spend 28 years on a remote tropical island. And at the beginning of the book, the beginning of the movie, Robinson Crusoe has a Bible with him, and he opens the Bible to Psalm 50, verse 15, which in my translation reads, And call upon me in the day of distress, and I will free you, and you shall honor me. And that verse will be a weave that will appear later in the book and in the movie. So Psalm 50 is the Robinson Crusoe Psalm. It might also be entitled, Here Comes the Judge, because this is a psalm that describes a divine tribunal, a theme we see elsewhere in Tanakh, Isaiah chapter 1, Micah chapter 6, Amos chapter 5, and in that regard, the description of God as judge is often the judge at the end of days, when in that future time, God will do the final judgment. And indeed, the classic biblical commentators, almost without exception, Radak, Rashi, Ibn Ezra, Sforno, will say that this psalm is a description of a future time, not of the time of the writer, but of a time of final judgment, a time of resurrection of the dead. Um, for one of those commentators, Bachia ben Asher, writing in 13th, 14th century Spain. And so this is, a, in the classic mode, a description of future time. It's a psalm by the second most um, prolific writer of the psalms. Number one, of course, is King David. But number two is the first time today that we're reading the writing of Asaph. Asaph is noted in the first book of Chronicles, second book of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah as a leading Levite singer. And in this case, what is remarkable is that Asaph here writes as a prophet. What is a prophet? A prophet is someone who is a mouthpiece for God, Navi. Until now, and I've even speculated in the Psalms of David earlier, to what degree is this God's voice or not, emphasizing that the pronouns in Hebrew aren't capitalized. Here it's outright prophecy, meaning the psalm writer is speaking or writing as if it is God speaking. Martin Cohen, Rabbi Cohen, who I mentioned in, I think, Psalm 47, he imagines this image of this psalm as God entering the courthouse, entering into the courtroom, and the writer is watching from the gallery with heaven and earth as the witnesses before God, as the people are on trial. And what are they on trial for? What is this prophet preaching? He's preaching against formal worship, as if that's what God wants, the sacrifices alone. And he's preaching 
in a second oration. It will have two orations against hypocrisy in the strongest terms. So with that, let me tell you the structure so as to have an eye for what you're listening for. And then I'll read Psalm 50, which I entitle from one of its phrases, not for your offerings will I rebuke you. For again, a key theme here is the two orations. Oration A, I don't need your offerings. Oration B is, I, don't, I want your offerings, but only if they're in the context of fidelity to righteousness. All right, time to share and read. Oh, I've got to open it. One second. Okay, one second. All right, here we go. Psalm 50. Oh, the, uh, the, I was going to tell you the um, organization. Verses 1 to 6 are um, the judge is coming, judge has arrived, and it'll end with Selah. That's the introduction. Verses 7 to 15 are the first oration, I don't need your sacrifices. And verse 16 to 22 is the second oration, Beware Hypocrites, with a closing line as God addresses the virtuous. Psalm 50, Not for your offerings will I rebuke you. A Psalm of Asaph, El, God, Adonai, has spoken and called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. From Zion, absolute beauty, God has shone forth. Let our God come and not be silent. A fire preceding God consumes and round about it storms mightily. Let God call to the heavens from above and to the earth to judge. God's people. Gather to me, my devotees, those who seal my covenant with me with offerings, and let the heavens declare God's righteousness, for God is the judge. Selah. Hear my people, and I will speak, O Israel. I will testify against you. God, your God, am I. Not for your offerings will I rebuke you, nor for your burnt offerings that are before me daily, nor will I take from your estate a bull, nor from your pens goats. For mine is every living creature of the forest, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know intimately every bird of the mountains and the fields creeping animals are mine. If I were hungry, I would not say it to you, for mine is the world and its fullness. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or the blood of goats do I drink? Offer to God the thanksgiving and make hold to the Most High your vows and call upon me in the day of distress. I will free you and you shall honor me. But to the wicked God says, what is it for you to recount my statues and to lift up my covenant upon your mouth when you have hated moral instruction, tossing my words behind you? If you see a thief, you make excuses for him, and with adulterers is your portion. Your mouth you toss for evil, and your tongue cleaves fast to deceit. You sit against your sibling you speak. Your mother's child you slander. These you have done, and should I keep silent? Do you think that I would be like you? I rebuke you and set a case before your eyes. Understand this, please. You who are forgetting God, 
lest I tear into pieces with none to save. One who offers thanksgiving honors me, who sets a proper way, I will show deliverance of God. I smile as I finish because to hear God's voice in this psalm is to hear a God who does not mince words, who is direct. And I guess that's what it means to be in the divine image, is to be Yashar. You know, that's the explanation of Yaakov, the name Yaakov, is Laakov, to go around, and Yisrael, the name change, is to be Yashar El, to be straight with God, to wrestle with God and to be direct, or it can be to be like God, one who is straight, Yashar. So some analysis of the word choices in this psalm. You'll see up front in verse 1, three names in a row for God, El, Elohim, and Adonai. Now, the name El is the common name for God in the Near East at that time. It's in Canaanite. God is called El. Sometimes El gets translated as um, certain medieval Jewish commentators as chesed, as kindness. Often, though, others see it as just powerful one or deity, generic, because it is the language of the Canaanite world out in the, in the place of what will later be, you know, think of Jerusalem was previously a Canaanite city. Elohim, God, that name for God, Elohim, is often identified with judgment. Even human judges are called Elohim. Elohim is the generic name of what God does, namely source of authority, power, judge. Adonai, the third name, is the intimate name, the God of relationship often identified with mercy. This triplet of God's name only occurs one other place in Tanakh, in Joshua 22, 22. There's something else. Uh, and so, you know, God has spoken, called the earth from the rising of the sun to its going down. There's... I originally had Eastern rising, and that Mizrach in Hebrew is both rising, but is also Zoreach, to um, emit light, as it is the nature of the light of dawn. It's also the word for east, and that the sun rises in the east. So here God is calling, and from the rising of the sun to its going down can either be understood as physical, in that all the earth is God's, or it can be temporal, that it's in the expanse of time. From Zion, and here's a word, the third word in Hebrew in verse 2, michlal, appears only here in the whole of Tanakh, which again is part of the beauty and the challenge of poetry, is often using words in creative ways. Here, michlal yofi, yofi is beautiful, but I just want to throw out some different English translations for this word, michlal. In the King James Version, it's perfection of beauty. Martin Cohen, sublime beauty. Robert Alter, zenith of beauty. Art Scroll, consummation of beauty. I chose maybe just to be different, absolute beauty. In terms of the root is kolel, meaning inclusiveness of beauty. It is, in that sense, consummate beauty, because um, it includes all, hence my choice of absolute beauty. God has shown forth. Let our God come and not be silent. This is an invitation for God to speak. And here in verse 3, the sense of Mount Sinai, 
You remember at Mount Sinai before God spoke in that pivotal moment of Jewish memory, of biblical memory, the mountain was ablaze. And so a fire precedes God, and also at Mount Sinai there was the sense of storm, storming mightily. And I'll point out that the word not be silent, yecherash, will occur also in the second to last verse of the psalm, Psalm 21, and the envelope will also be Elohim, here in verse 1 and verse 2, the name of God. Let God call, verse 4, to the heavens from above to judge God's people. Gather me, chasidai, my devotees. Chasid, we're, we're used to the word chasid, but in the biblical Hebrew, the root is kindness, often identified with loyalty to covenant. Um, therefore, devotees who seal my covenant with me, with offerings. And now what will continue, circle the word offering, zevach, which is also sacrifice. A sign of covenant, a sign of relationship with God is the bringing of the offerings which are at the center of this psalm's critique. And let the heavens, so you'll notice this reference to heavens, verse 2 verse 4 and verse 6. It's like every other line. The sense of the heavens, the heavens also represent in a physical realm that which is enduring. Let the heavens declare God's righteousness. Let them testify. Let the heavens be witness to God is the judge, that which is enduring, Selah. And now, God speaks. Hear my people. Intimacy. My people. And I will speak. When you listen, that's when I'll speak. There's a sense of relationship. Oh, Israel. <laughs> and now it begins to tighten up. I will testify against you. And here's the key motif. Elohim Elohecha. God, your God, Anochi, am I. And Anochi, that's the first word of the Ten Commandments. Anochi Adonai Elohecha. I am the Lord your God. So Mount Sinai, God as power, as judge, giver of the law, is resonating. And now, Lo Alzivachecha Ochichecha. And you can hear again that rhythm in the Hebrew. Lo Alzivachecha not for your offerings will I rebuke you, nor for your burnt offerings that are before me daily. Now, the word tamid in verse 8, the last word in Hebrew, I translate daily here, but here too there's a wordplay. Tamid means like the ner tamid in the synagogue, the lamp that burns perpetually continually, but there is also an offering called the tamid that was brought every day in the morning and in the late afternoon, and that in its communal constancy represented the connection to God. And so, and that was a burnt offering, hence, nor for your burnt offerings that are before me daily, nor will I take from your estate a bull, in the singular, the bull is the most expensive, significant of offerings, nor from your pen's goats. For mine is every living creature of the forest, the cattle upon a thousand hills. The classic commentators to verse 10, because they're reading this as a foretelling of the future, will say, like Rashi will say, what is this cattle upon a thousand hills? That's referring to the feast in the future day of the Garden of Eden, when the righteous will be fed by God. I know intimately every bird of the mountains. And I, again, I, I love to circle the words that are unique or rare. And here's one of them, verse 11. Viziz Sadai only appears in one other place, and that's Psalm 80, verse 14. Ziz can mean like zoos, 
move. Rashi understands it as creeping, but again, it's a rare image and it's an image that conveys motion. And imadi, our mind, but here's another play on words. Amod is to stand. So God is standing and things are moving around God, but God is solid, unmoving. Yadati, the word yadati suggests intimate knowledge, like Adam knew Eve, Genesis 4.1, who yadat chava ishto, or Job, with God speaking in verse 30, chapters 38 and 39. So here God is saying, I'll continue, if I were hungry, I would not say it to you. I wouldn't need to say it to you, because the whole world and its fullness, that's mine. That echoes Psalm 24, 1, where the whole earth is mine. Do I eat of the flesh of bulls or the blood of goats do I drink? Disparaging, again, what was not uncommon in the mythology of Gilgamesh and Sumerian writing of a god dependent for food. Here, God dismisses the need for the sacrifices for God. Offer to God the thanksgiving and make whole the most high your vows. But here, verse 14 and 15, God is not rejecting all offerings. This is the bridge. Verse 14 and 15, the end of the first oration, is also the bridge to the second oration, which God says, do offer to God the thanksgiving. Circle the word zevach toda, thanksgiving. Here's why. Leviticus 7.12 describes the zevach shlamim. These whole offerings were offerings of gratitude. The rabbis will teach, Tanhuma Parsha Amor 14, that in the time of the Messiah, the only offering that will still be offered is that of gratitude, the zevach shlamim, described here. It was the most common offering in the time of the temple. When you wanted to express gratitude to God for something good that happened in your life, the birth of a child, you would go and you would bring the whole offering and you would take back for barbecue with your family most of it. You would just leave the left hind quarter for the priest as the tax, the gift of service. But most of this lamb you would take and it would be a celebratory meal in which it was a holy meal because some had been given to God through God's servant. And so 14 and 15, it's not a rejection of sacrifice. This is the bridge. Offer to God the thanksgiving and make whole to the Most High your vows. Call upon me in the day of distress, beyond Sarah, that day of narrowness, the day of Tsuris. Call me, I will free you and you shall honor me. But now God goes back, and the shift is, this is the condemnation of hypocrisy. And he may be speaking here, Asaf, to fellow, he's a Levite, right? He's a singer. And the real power in the hierarchy is the priests. They're the ones who take the sacrifices. The Levites are the choir, they're the facilitator. He may be speaking out against the powerful, the Kohanim, or... He may be speaking unclear to simply those Israelites who come thinking that by simply doing ritual, they can live their life of immorality. But to the wicked, God says, what is it for you to recount my statues and lift up my covenant upon your mouth? So here, he, the psal psalmist is speaking to somebody who knows the statues and covenant. They're in that person's mouth. Some, later the medieval commentators, will see this as a challenge to scholars who are hypocrites. Those who are learned in the law, but don't live out its moral demands. Verse 17, when you have hated Musar, moral instruction, later this word Musar would become a whole category of ethical instruction and learning and a whole tradition of character building, tossing 
v'tashlech, tossing my words behind you. So again, you're not internalizing my words. They're upon your mouth, but you're spitting them out. If you see a thief, and this is the accusation, you make excuses for him. You justify that kind of wrongdoing. And with adulterers who violate the law, and mind you, 18, those are two of the Ten Commandments, you shall not steal, lotanof, you shouldn't commit adultery. And here again, the word toss in verse 19, shalachta, your mouth you toss for evil, and your tongue clings fast to deceit. Verse 20, you sit, and I chose to do it this way, namely as a colon, to kind of prolong the image of you're just sitting. Now there, since we're coming full circle today with Psalm 50, remember Psalm 1? Ashrei Ha'ish, it begins, happy is the person, and then it'll con continue, Umoshav leitzim lo yashav, but in the gathering of scorners, you do not sit. Who sits idly and gossips is the reference, as the rabbis understand, the opening of Psalms, verse 1, 1. Here you sit, and again, the accusation is you are an evil speaker, and no less than against your own sibling. You speak. Ben Imcha, the son of your mother, your mother's child, Ti Tendofi, you slander, you create contempt, is another way it's translated. These have I done. Now, again, the bridge. And should I, these you have done. So here's something that's really remarkable. In verses 16 to 21, the word you in Hebrew is repeated 24 times. Verses 16 to 21, that's the, the second oration. So God is, you can see God pointing the finger, you, 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 you. These you have done, and should I keep silent? Now that, of course, is a choice to see it as a question. Some translate it as these things you have done, and I don't keep silent. Did you think I would be like you? And here's a wonderful word play. I put in capital, I would be. The word in Hebrew, eheye, that is God's word describing God. It's a pun. Exodus 3.14, at the burning bush, eheye imach. I, this is God speaking, I will be with you. So do you think that I will be like you? I'm going to change that to will for the final copy, um, which is, you know, so it's both. I am God. I'm not like you, but it's the wordplay of God's revelation of God's name, that, which is to say, I am not like you. I rebuke you and set a case before your eyes. This is God as judge. I rebuke you. That same word, ochiach, that we saw earlier. And understand this, please. And I love the fact that it puts the word in Hebrew, na, please. God often is very polite. Even in the Akedah, which we're going to read second day, Please take your son, your only son, the one you love. But God will say, please. Understand this, please. You who are shochechei eloha, you who are forgetting God, lest I tear into pieces with none to save. Now, that's again, not mincing words. And the concluding line, you can add the word but, but that would be an addition. One who offers thanksgiving honors me. Back to Zoveach Toda. One who is grateful to me. One who acknowledges my role, not only as the giver, because God here in this psalm is emphasized that God created all the animals of the field. All your food, I, God, created for you. But more, I have given you moral instruction. And if you offer thanksgiving, if you honor me, 
That person who sets a proper path, the sum derech, I will show deliverance of God. And the rabbis will emphasize, if you set a proper way by offering thanksgiving and genuinely honoring God, then God will fulfill, will do a response of caregiving of deliverance of God. One final quote from Tana Debe Eliyahu Rabbah, which is a midrash, a collection of rabbinic sayings edited in the 10th century, according to scholars, but it's already mentioned in the Bavli, which also is well, edited in the 9th century, around the year 800. So it, it was a collection that had existed, but only gets formally edited in the 10th century. And there's a, the following quote that's relevant. My children, my beloved ones, am I lacking anything that I make demands of you? All that I ask is that you should love each other, honor each other, and respect each other. And so I'll pull this together to get your reactions. Tomorrow night is the beginning of the month of Elul, the month before the new year, the month in which we begin to do slichot. And Mike Maiman has a very good recording about slichot starting Thursday morning, every day, you'll get a email with the sounds of the shofar and a short teaching, many by me, some by congregants, so that starting tomorrow night is the penitential season. This is a psalm that honors God as judge who listens, who rebukes, who will not be silent, and yet who in the end seeks our expressions of faithfulness and love. With that, I will uh, invite some reactions to Psalm 50. I <laughs> don't see anybody. I don't have oh. all... Greens. So go ahead, Richard. Thank if nobody, you. If nobody wants to speak, I'll say something. I appreciate but if it, I'll stand down if somebody else has something to say. Go ahead, uh, Richard. I'm, I'm just reminded in the first four verses here of Psalm 50 in the opening lines of Psalm 19, uh, where it talks about the heavens declaring the glory of God day after day, night after night. Yeah. Um, they speak of him. Right. And it talks about the earth, uh, God calling the earth to judge. And, of course, the earth is part of the heavens. Our earth is part of those heavens that are also. So anyway, as you were reading across that, I, I was uh, reminded of the entry point there, or the opening part of Psalm 19. Thank you, Richard. So let me just read Psalm 19, verse 2, echoing and amplifying. Hashemayim misaprim kavod el, the heavens tell or declare the glory of God, umase yadav magid harakia, and God's handiwork is related by the firmament. So verse 19 has the same kind of motif in terms of the heavens bearing witness. And here as court is called, verse 2, 4, and 6, the heavens are called to witness God's presence as supreme. And so those are reoccurring motifs. And yet here in Psalm 50, what is unlike any psalm we've read to this point is the psalmist as prophet. The psalmist, this is not a prayer to God. That's what we usually think of psalms. This is the psalm writer speaking as the vehicle of God, as the prophet challenging unclear, but challenging authority, a challenging hypocrisy, and that it's also in Psalms. You know, normally we say when we, regarding prayer and study, when we read sacred texts, God is speaking to us. When we pray, we're speaking to God. Psalms are generally thought of as prayer, but that is important to understand also that for us, here's a, a key idea for me, when I'm reading 
prayers. As I'm preparing this afternoon, I'll be doing some recordings about High Holiday prayer introductions. Prayers are not only our, we're not only asked to hear in the words of the prayer writer, our experience. Sometimes they are like a great song. They're giving words for our experience. That's a aspect of prayer or song. But sometimes the goal of prayer is to ask us a question, to evoke, to say, why, what is this person writing this poem? What they're so bothered by, and why doesn't it bother me? <laughs> why am I not so upset? It's a challenge rather than an identification. And, and that's what I love about Psalm 50, is it is a prayer of a kind, because that's prayer too, to feel challenged as if, why aren't we experiencing what we would see God experiencing in looking at the world and seeing hypocrisy, in seeing the performance of ritual as if that was what a true judge seeks in a moral order. One last comment from anybody, and then I'll pull it together, aware of time. Arnold, go ahead. You have to unmute yourself. Can you just... There, there we go. go. Okay. Go ahead, Arnold. You, know, you pointed out uh, verse 15 at the beginning of your, uh, your comments, and um, um, verse 15... I think has its limits in terms of call upon God, God will respond favorably. But there's a limit. Um, it may be, I think that limit is, um, call it personal troubles, personal issues. <clears throat> but once it gets beyond <coughs> the individual in, and, and to the community, then there's a danger. And, and, and what what I what's um, what I'm thinking of here is um, um, the destruction of the temple, um, external forces acting on society. Um, people called on God, but God didn't respond. So, so I think me, that, that verse 15 to me, th there's a limit there. So let me respond. That's great, Arnold. I'm so pleased that you refocused us on Psalm 15 because that's where we started with the Robinson Crusoe. Um, verse, and I'm so glad we go back to fi finishing with this. So let me reread Psalm 15, verse 15, and then make a comment regarding your astute observation, Arnold. Verse 15, Ukraini biyom sara, and call upon me in the day of your distress, achaletzcha utchabdeni, I will free you, and you shall honor me. I'm getting ready to do prayer introductions. And one of the most stirring prayers of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is called the Utana Tokef. That's the prayer with the famous line, who shall live and who shall die? And then there's refrain, Uchuva utfila utstaka, but by the doing of repentance, prayer, and acts of justice, ma'avirin et roa hagzera you shall overcome the awfulness of the decree. And some rabbis, this one included, circle the word roa, which means the awfulness of the decree, which is to say bad things may still occur, but how you experience them depends on your mindset, on your ability to accept bad things in life. I know sick, sick people at the moment, and they... They have a decree. I, I watched my brother-in-law yesterday who has ALS and making a rapid decline and he's doing videos right now. And he was talking in this video on how to invest um, about how he got struck by ALS. Nothing's gonna change that. He knows he's moving to the end of his life. But to watch these videos, I'm just free association because I did this yesterday, is to see truly a great spirit and how we overcome the decree is our choice. That's really what we have control over. Not whether the temple gets destroyed, but whether you rebuild with a different kind of Judaism that rather than sacrifices, focuses on prayer and build synagogues. And so here, 
verse 15, call upon me in the day of the distress. I will free you, achaletzcha, and you shall honor me. It's not clear, though for many, of course, it was read as literal, but for others, it's more a spiritual promise that you will be able to persevere and create and renew. And so with that, as we move toward high holidays, I wish all of us, actually we start doing this only on Thursday morning. Starting on Thursday morning is when it's traditional to send out high holiday greetings <laughs> and to wish each other a Shana Tova. So I do in anticipation of Thursday morning. With that, I thank you again for enabling the learning of Psalms a opportunity. Eric, do you have Kaddish in front of you? I can pull it up real quick. All right, because I'd have to go look. So we'll end with the saying of Kaddish, a chance to answer a man to those observing a yurt site or who are in mourning. <clears throat> I know that uh, Shirley and Mitchell, among others, are honoring loved ones. Thank you. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shmei rabba. Yitkadal v'yitkadash shmei rabba. Be'amai divra kirute v'yamlich malchute v'chayachon v'yom echon v'chaye v'chobet Yisrael v'agala v'zman kari v'imru amen. Yeah, I do look forward right after Yom Kippur to resume because it's my intention with you, hopefully, to get the next hundred psalms. Here's a tease. Er, ver, psalm 51, the inscription is a psalm <laughs> David after being chastised by Nathan the prophet for his affair with Bathsheba. So we haven't heard from David in a while. It's, it's the source of original sin in terms of a line in it. I was born by my mother's sinful act. You'll, so bottom line, Psalm 51, the adventure continues. Wishing all of you thank a Shana Tova. Shana Tova, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.